Hey, everyone. Before we get into today's interview, just wanted to drop a little reminder to stay up to date with all the latest episodes of On The Margin. You can subscribe to the BlockWorks Back Row YouTube. Just go up there, just click the little uh, subscribe button, or you can click the links at the top of this episode. It'll take you over to Apple, Spotify, whatever your preferred platform is. Just subscribe there. And if you could, leave a rating and review. Really appreciate it. All right, on with the show. All right, everyone, welcome back to another weekly round of edition of On the Margin. Hey, I'm joined, as always, by my energizing co-host, Mr. Mark Yusko. Whoa, you I feel know. a high-energy episode coming on here. This is a high-energy episode, and it starts at the top. I got the green candle t-shirt on, and then we go to the Bitcoin orange pants. And I, I have some file game, I mean, uh, file coin, sorry, file game, file coin sock game on today. A uh, little shout out to my my friends from the, the Vegas event. I just... There's something, there's some there, there. Um, we don't have to talk about that too much, but look, um, Bitcoin, green candles everywhere. Great week. Started off in a funny way. <laughs> Monday Oh my morning. God. Yeah. Did it ever. All right. So for folks who might not be as, as in the weeds of the, the crypto Bitcoin stuff as you and I are, Mark, there was a false start on the spot Bitcoin ETF announcement that came this Monday when Cointelegraph, which is a crypto news outlet, tweeted that the iShares ETF had been approved. Immediately, the price of Bitcoin ran up something like 10% in the span yeah. of about an hour. Um, the Everyone started to look around. Some of the other, like, like I think it was Reuters that also picked up on it. Um, and But there was no sources. So the ETF guys over at Bloomberg's, James Seyfert, Eric Balkunas, who are basically my, uh, my trusted source, started to question, well, what's the source for this, yada, yada. Then Cointelegraph switched the tweet to reportedly, and everyone said, wait, you were the original source here. What do you mean reportedly? Who are you reportedly who, who referring reported to? It? Who reported it? You reported it. And, uh, and then as it turns out, you know, all this, all this unfold, first, the ETF had not been approved. Um, this was confirmed by BlackRock. The SEC actually tweeted something out from their own Twitter, which is like, if, if, Be if careful you want- what you read on the internet. Yeah, I know. I, and to be honest... Yeah, usually I think the I'm not a huge fan of some of the media material that comes out of that account, but I have to admit we had it come. Not a great look for for the crypto folks here. Uh, but but what's uh, not, not crypto? Not a good look for media. Yeah, I agree. Right? I agree and with that. and look, the the crypto followers, them jumping on it. Okay, now I mean I I did repost. Uh, Retweet. I'm not going to say post. Retweet. I retweeted the original tweet. Um, it's my, you know, shout, anyway, fighting back. So I retweeted, but I said, this may not be true. Okay. But if it is, I told you. Because look, BlackRock is going to be approved. They are going to be approved first. I still believe they're going to be approved only, only BlackRock. Uh, people push back on, on that one. But uh, and, and a couple others did say, well, there's no source It's you know, likely untrue, but, but the reality is the reaction to that news is totally legit. I mean, in the sense of, yeah, when this is approved, there's going to be increased demand and it's not if it's when, so when this is approved, there's going to be increased demand, a lot of increased demand and prices are going to rise. And, and yet here we are on Friday, recording this on Friday, and prices back up a little higher than where it was. So people have been saying, you know what? It's coming. And uh, I think that's really interesting. So take a look at this. So this is the, for those of you following along on on the video here, this is the one month chart of Bitcoin. We can actually zoom into this week. So you can see this little spike here up to just over 30,000. Um, I, th- I think it actually topped over 30,000. I'm looking at trading view. It doesn't I show that. I think intraday but. or intraminute or whatever, it was 38, but the price didn't get right. posted. It's yeah. kind of, there's kind of a weird thing. And I don't know what the time horizon is for, for charts, but this happens occasionally where you'll see a print, but then when you go back and look at the, the, histor- the historical data, it's not there. So it must yep. be like in between the actual posting. Yeah, I I'm, I also don't 100% understand how this stuff gets calculated. But that, because I remember, I remember someone 
posted a screenshot of them selling above 30,000. So what, whatever, it, it ran up to about 30,000, surrendered most of its gains extremely quickly. But then the interesting thing was after that, you would expect it to just go trading right back to where it was, if not lower, right? As the wind had been taken out of people's sales, 100 million of short, got, uh, 100 million of longs got liquidated, whatever, whatever. But what's been interesting is the trend up since. And now the, the current price of Bitcoin is even higher than what it was when it wicked up. And I'd love to get your thoughts on this, Mark. But I think for me, if I had to put an explanation around this, uh, you know, with the caveat, this is not necessarily my area of expertise. I think that folks got surprised by just how violently the market reacted to this. Yeah. This is a perennial question within crypto. Is this priced in or is it not priced in? And one thing that I think people consistently get wrong in this space is in in TradFi, when you ask, is it priced in? The answer is almost always yes. It's almost always priced in. In crypto, it is almost always no as a heuristic. People argue about this. Just prediction. A couple months from now, people are going to start arguing about whether or not the halving is priced in. And it won't be. It this, won't be. This, no, no. It's, it's a great observation. And it, and it goes to uh, maturity of markets, right? Right. In the 20s, in the 1920s, in the roaring 20s, stuff was not priced in into equities. There was lots of manipulation. There was lots of scams. There was lots of, of big movements on, on, you know, little things. And, and, and then that changed a little bit. And, and then by the seventies and eighties, there were still, you know, things that weren't priced in, in the sense that you had message boards. I love, you know, message boards and the whole famous thing of, of, Michael Saylor's micro strategy was totally manipulated, right? From $3 to $330 back to three, all by these message boards. I mean, he got fined, people got fined. I think, I think some kid might've gone to jail. I can't remember, but I mean, so markets mature and, and media coverage matures and, the quality of analysis. Now that, uh, and, and again, it's not a, you know poke at anybody in particular, but the quality of analysis in our space, in, in fact, if I claim to be part of the, the digital asset space or the crypto space, it's still working itself to a level of, of high quality. There are some great organizations, there's some great research organizations, but by and large, stuff gets thrown out there. Like what happened on Monday, right? So, you were telling me before we, we got going that I, I thought the whole thing about the intern was a joke, right? I, I thought they were saying, oh, it was an intern. Well, I guess it was an intern that, you know, read something on a chat group or a chat room and posted it with no source. That's not what media does, right? Media has to have a source. And then people just fly into it and say, oh, okay, I got, I got to buy, I got to buy. Well, how, where's the analysis of, well, what does this mean? You know, Eric Buckingham did this, right? He actually said, okay, there's $30 trillion of assets that right now are prohibited from investing in Bitcoin, right? The firms have said, the RA firms said, nope, can't, can't own it. When there's a BlackRock ETF, they're going to have to let people own it. They're going to have to let their customers buy it. So let's say it's a 0.1% allocation. That's $30 billion. Well, but Mark, $30 billion on $500 billion isn't that much. Well, but $500 billion doesn't trade. There's about $100 billion that really trades, and it's even smaller than that on a daily basis. $30 billion will move the price. We saw that on Monday. But what if it's 1% allocation, which would be a prudent allocation, which... People have, there are a lot of people that have 1%, 2%, 3%. Some have lots more, but a prudent allocation would be a 1% position, like, like a gold at 2 or 3 or 4%. So that's $300 billion. $300 billion on a $500 billion asset. <laughs> and that ain't priced in. That is, I, I'm on the record, that is not priced in. All right. So there are three things that we're talking about here. One, which is just the the media coverage of this and how we need to get better in crypto digital assets. Two, this point about expectations, I actually had a long conversation 
with a BlockWorks research subscriber about exactly this problem. And then three, there's the the ETF that we're talking about and how priced in that is. So just to just to get because I don't know 100 percent for this to be true. So instead of saying it's an intern, someone at Coin Telegraph, yeah, this is what I've heard, unverified, yeah. allegedly. But someone did this did what the source for this tweet came from a Telegram chat. Someone did a, a shit post and this uh, it literally just got posted onto the Twitter. And then it was, you know, there's a video circulating online of the editor in chief, instead of taking uh, taking responsibility, basically saying it's the fault of everyone for wanting news so fast. So this was just a bit of a black eye. You know, that, of- that is so bad. I mean, that is, that is Brian Kelly-esque, right? Brian Kelly, the former coach of Notre Dame, now coach of LSU. Brian's this egomaniac that has never been wrong in his life and he, he never takes responsibility. So he'll blame the refs. He'll blame the weather. He'll blame the players. No editor. It's you, you say I did a bad job. I didn't have controls in place so that an actual reporter, not an intern could actually put something into the main feed of our organization that that's on me as, as a leader society, you know, this is, this is actually a bigger, broader problem of, you know, participation trophies, right? It's never anybody's fault anymore. Society's fault. It's, you know, you're, you're a good person. Even if you come in 10th place out of 10, (laughs) no, you're a loser. And (laughs) if you make mistakes like this, you're a loser. So get better. All of us get better. Good reminder for for all of us to get better here. Uh, now, I, I want to I, the the this this particular question of the the Bitcoin ETF. I one thing I've been starting to we've talked about it a little bit on this show, but I feel it's appropriate to ask is I think the reason why you're seeing this run up right now is there's a couple things. First, there have been some wins in the courts uh, against the SEC. So yeah. actually, so some well and and a setback in the courts, which we can talk about as well. Yeah. But basically. The so, so actually the SEC last night dismissed their suit against Brad Garlinghouse and uh, Chris Larson of Ripple XRP, and it looks like the GBTC conversion was going well until this uh, lawsuit from the or the suit from the uh, New York Attorney General got fired about against both Gemini and uh, DCG, which we can talk about as well. But it looks like it looks like the courts are pushing back on some of the overreach that the SEC was having. So there's a narrative, there is a regulatory narrative here as folks are starting to get more comfortable. But then there is also this, we we've sort of known, right, that there's this catalyst for Bitcoin in the form of the having and the spot ETF. I think what this did was it reminded folks like, whoa, this whole whole I know it it feels not very good right now, but in just three or four months. There's this catalyst that we can see from this overreaction on Monday that people are off sides. That if this news were to be approved, it would have a material impact. You know, not financial advice, anything like that, but clearly it had a material impact on on the price very quickly. So I think that's what you're seeing the market kind of wake up and realize. There is a broader macro here story for why for why this could be happening. I I love this explanation. Um, this came from oh gosh. Got to make sure I get uh, Quinn over at Maple Finance, mm-hmm. but he he pointed. We were going back and forth on, on Twitter about this, and he he said this a couple months ago. So I got to give him credit. He's like, soon Bitcoin's going to start to trade the other way. People will look for explanations why, but it's really just that real rates have peaked. And I think that might be a very good explanation for this because gold, in the same way, trades in an inverse pattern to real rates, actually. And and more critically, it actually trades based on the expectation, the forward-looking expectation of real rates. And there's this, there's this interview that I have saved somewhere because I thought it was so uh, instructive. But you know, when the 1970s, 80s inflation period was going on, the peak period of inflation did not correspond to the peak period of gold prices. Actually, gold started to sell off because the idea was that real rates... Uh, could not get more negative than they were now, and they they topped out, if that makes sense. So I think right now, one thing that the market could be looking at, we we can actually get you know five or ten year tips up here, which is just around two and a half percent real yield on a ten year basis, which is extremely attractive 
And the market might be saying, that's probably as much positive real yield as you can expect. It's going to trend the other way, which Bitcoin should respond positively to. So I think there is a broader macro story here as well. No, well, there, there, there absolutely is. And, and that was uh, codified for all time now in, in real media. Larry Fink, right, the president of BlackRock, uh, went on CNBC. Um, I guess some people don't call CNBC real TV, but I think it's real TV. Um, and uh, in the afternoon on Monday, and basically said, you know, rumor, not not fact. You know, we we haven't been approved. You know, we're, we're still uh, making. In fact, they two days later, it was reported that they had made the the comments back to the SEC because October seventeenth, Tuesday was the day on which either it had to be approved or they had to say, hey, you have to give us more and there's another 90 days. So uh, that clearly happened. And, but Larry came on TV and said, uh, amongst other things, uh, well, really, you know, things are, are pretty tough out there and people are afraid. And so there's a flight to quality in treasuries, gold and crypto which it, Bitcoin, crypto, people get mad, that, but Bitcoin is a cryptocurrency. I mean, it, it just is. But, um, and like, he, means, he means Bitcoin, not crypto. Whatever, yes, he, his application is for Bitcoin. Maybe he's not allowed to say the word Bitcoin because he's in the, I don't know. Um, I don't think he really doesn't understand. He's a pretty smart guy. Um, but, but it is demand for other cryptocurrencies as well. But, but bottom line is, Bitcoin is is the safe haven. Uh, other things are, are, you know, you can argue whether other things are good, bad, or indifferent, but Bitcoin is digital gold. I had this, I had this amazing experience uh, two nights ago um, where I went down to Charlotte and it was me, Guy Swan, uh, a banker from Fifth Third, and uh, my new cat loves, loves Bitcoin too. Um, my new cat loves Bitcoin, but, uh, and a Fed governor. So we had a, a, a governor from the, the Richmond Fed who agreed to debate us on the future of money. I mean, bravo to him. I, I, I mean, I, I was like, wow, that, that is, that is, that is very cool. And we had a great discussion of, of the future money. And, and the reality is that, you know, we all kind of came, well, we probably already reached the conclusion, but I think that the body of work, especially from Guy Swan, who is really good. I mean, he's really good um, on the history and and why sound money is so, so vital. Um, that's, that's Bitcoin. Bitcoin is better money. It, it just is. So that is to the point of real interest rates likely peaking. And we've seen lots of evidence of that, right? Stocks are actually down since August. Um, and the only thing that, that that's a little fly in that ointment, it started last week. You know, we said that the bonds had had a nice rally and, the, and they gave most of that back this week because um, people got got freaked out again by, by some of the economic numbers, which continue to come in hot. I know. I mean, hot, like... The, the GDP now for the Atlanta Fed uh, GDP we now talk for about Q3 this, yeah. is 5%. Mark, what did it start at this quarter? Uh, three? Zero. 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 No, wait. No way. Was it yeah. zero? Yeah. No way. Hold on a second. Yeah. I, I believe Jim, you. Jim, I mean, Jim, that, Bianco, that. Jim Bianco put out a really great thread about this, about the the crazy revision going into going into this quarter. Yeah. Look, here, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so, so for those who don't, the, there's a- there's oh, the a, consensus, the consensus, consensus was zero, and consensus is only at, at three and a half. But uh, the Atlanta okay. Fed started at three and a half. I mean, it started at the high end, um, but consensus was at zero, for sure. Yeah. It's just, it, it's just interesting. I mean, that is the- I think that's the thing that's persistently stayed much stronger than than folks thought. The retail sales came in a little bit hotter than expected too. I 
I think what's happened just to, I mean, we've talked this whole, this whole summer basically about being in limbo and I feel like we're moving out of limbo here and we should talk about Powell's speech um, that he gave this week as well, where he talked about what we've been talking about on this show, which is the uh, yields that are rising in the long end of the curve. So the 10 year at the time of this recording is just under 5%. The, we've been talking about this inverted yield curve, which was inverted by more than 100 basis points for a good portion of this year. That is almost uninverted at this point. Um, if it keeps, you know, it's 90 basis points of inversion has been erased in the last, you know, three and a half months or so. So, uh, you know, what what Jerome Powell addressed, I can actually get the the quote here. The, you know, how he sees that as a tightening in financial conditions. So the quote is financial conditions have tightened significantly in recent months, and longer term bond yields have been an important driving factor in this tightening. We remain attentive to these developments because persistent changes in financial conditions can have implications for the path of monetary policy. But I think that that statement does indicate what we were talking about, which is I, I think this is what the Fed wanted to happen. I think they wanted longer term yields to rise. That leads to tighter financial conditions for those that need to finance at those rates, which is most corporates in the U.S. And eventually, people that's gonna that's gonna lead to demand destruction. And the the other the other place for this to show up as well is still housing, because what you haven't seen is I mean mortgage rates topped out for a thirty year mortgage. It's above eight percent now. Housing prices have not budged. Mortgage applications are sinking. Turnover of homes is lower because people are locked in. But you know, you just haven't seen a new clearing rate for eight percent mortgages. There's this this conundrum, right, where things look pretty good from an economic perspective. If you look at the economic data, you know, we had two percent growth, two percent growth. Now they're saying we're going to have five percent growth. Retail sales. Now the retail sales thing. Part of that was just oil prices went back up and gas prices went back up, and a big chunk is is gasoline. Okay, fine. Um, that's, that's not going to play well for the, for the next election, by the way. Uh, if oil prices are over 100 and gasoline prices get back to, to four bucks at the pump. So expect, expect something. What's going on, everybody? Thank you for listening to On The Margin. I just wanted to take a quick moment to let you know about a very special offer that we have coming out of BlockWorks Research. Now, many of you will probably be familiar with our platform, but BlockWorks Research is the most blue chip spot to get research, data, governance, models, and a whole lot more about the leading DeFi protocols in the space. I've leaned on our analysts time and time again to explain complicated concepts going on in DeFi to me like I'm five years old. They can do the same for you. If you invest in DeFi or are just interested in it, it is an absolute no-brainer. As a listener of On The Margin, and to say thank you all for listening to the show, you can use Margin 10 for a 10% discount, and that gives you access to everything, which would be weekly in-depth reports, live data, all of that good stuff. So again, that's code MARGIN10 for a 10% discount. Link is in the show notes. Sign up now. Thank you later. There's a great thread that um, I know we're, we've been talking quite a bit about bonds, but I just I feel like that is the big story right now. Bob Elliott put out a great thread, which I'm sharing on my screen here, just contextualizing the drawdown in bonds. Uh, I mean, this goes. This is a chart that goes all the way back. It covers U.S. government bonds. So, assuming this is at um, you know all terms, but going back to base, it looks like the starting of the country pre 1800. Yes, and yeah, this yeah. is now you know the worst drawdown. Um, or, or nearing, you know, second whatever worst, yeah. second. second worst drawdown. Yeah. But the first one was when we didn't even really know how to operate a bond market. So that one probably doesn't count. Yeah. I don't think we had like a modern constitution at that point. I think we were still articles of confederation slash that, that drawdown looks like mid 1700s. I mean, that was, I think revolutionary war bonds yeah. we were issuing yeah, them back exactly. there. And to, and to put it in context, the, the drawdown in bonds is much worse than what happened during the U S civil war. So it's 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 very bad. And the the other thing that I would someone someone made this point just because we were talking about tips and real yield here, and that that has implications for real assets like or hard assets like Bitcoin or gold. The the real swing here has been in real yields. Real yields were at one point when inflation was at you know nine percent and interest rates were at two. I mean it was like negative nine percent real yields here, and now we're at positive two and a half percent. It's like been a ten percent swing in real yields over a relatively short period of time. I mean, that could be a part, a big part of the story as well, I think. Well, and then, you know, another big part is 
you know, um, we were an emerging market, you know, with, with very little assets, very little development, you know, no uh, organized financial markets. You know, we didn't even have the buttonwood tree back in the 1700s. Uh, and even, even, you know, post civil war, we were just starting to kind of meet in New York city and think about organizing trading and, uh, and the debt is a number that's incomprehensible at 33 and a half trillion with a T. Okay. So that drawdown is the percentage drawdown. That isn't the actual drawdown, that actual drawdown Orders of magnitude, but now you got to inflation adjust, fine. But even, I'm I'm willing to go on the record, probably without doing the math, uh, that or not 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 probably without doing the math, but I'm probably right um, that this is bigger, even inflation adjusted, like orders of magnitude bigger, and it's just because the law of large numbers and the decimation in places that have not bubbled to the surface yet. I mean, I, I, I just terrible, so terrible. It, where it just, do you think those, where do you think those places are? Regional banks. There's a whole bunch of banks that are insolvent right now. Completely, totally insolvent. I mean, done, board them up, distribute what's left. But there's this government program that says, no, 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 you're, you're fine. You're fine. We'll buy them all but you don't have the money. Well, well, we'll just make it. Well, if you make it, then what happens to the rest of the money? Well, we'll worry about that later. So, so this, that, but banks definitely. Um, companies, there's a whole bunch of companies that borrowed at really low rates and levered the crap out of their, that's a technical term, out of their balance sheets. And, um, not everyone, but like, you know, the, the one that I, that I loved, um, and it's not a problem for them, but you know, everyone talks about Apple's cash hoard. They have more debt than cash now. They didn't used to, but now they have more debt than cash. And that means they don't have a cash hoard, right? If you owe more than you have in the bank, then you don't have a cash hoard. And how did that happen? Whoa. How did that happen? It's, it, well, I'll tell you how. Uncle Warren demanded his buybacks. Mm. So you, good, good Tim, you go borrow money from all the peasants and you give me my money that I don't have to pay taxes on in my beautiful structure. Remember, he's the reason that that bill got passed in the drawda in the lockdowns that said, I mean, I'm not in the lockdowns, before the lockdowns, when they cut corporate taxes, mm. that was, that was uncle Warren. That was not Donald Trump. That was, that was Warren Buffett likes to own assets that buy back their stock from him because it, it works really well for him because he didn't have to pay taxes on it. Mad genius. Like I, <laughs> this is not a criticism of Warren Buffett. It's, it's praise and admiration, but the average little guy can't, can't do that. And uh, it, like I said, Apple's not in trouble, um, but they, you know, they're gonna, eventually someone's going to have to pay back the debt. Well, one thing that I think, it, so we also had earnings this week, we can talk about a little bit from, uh, we're, and we're moving into earnings season here, but I'm looking at the earnings from Netflix and Tesla. So, you know, yeah. one of the, and, and I saw a good, I a good thread about this. So Netflix earnings, um, their Q3 earnings, their revenue came in at 8.54 billion um, against 8.53. So it's a beat. Okay, great. Um, EPS came at came in at 215 versus 217. Um, the streaming paid net change came in at uh, 8.76 against an estimate of 6.2. So that's great. And usually it's not Revenue. I haven't paid attention to Netflix earnings in a little while, but it used to be the subscriber number, the primarily the international subs number, which people really care about that would drive the stock price. But what you're starting to see, I think, with even a lot of these fangs are you know, at some point the growth is going to slow. 
And at that it already has. It already Apple's has. Growth is is negative, right? Their revenue growth is negative. To defend Uncle Warren and Apple a little bit, isn't this is the theory, right? Of like you you grow really quickly. Your stock gets a premium because there's this expectation of growth, but then you just sort of a law of large numbers things, or you don't have as many markets to invest products. That's when you start returning cash to shareholders. So maybe, you know, part of the the growth fang story is now it's the fang value story. And, you know, people that, these are great businesses. They are great businesses. And I know I agree with you that there's no business so great that you can't mess it up by the price you pay. Yeah. But some of these, but like Apple looks like a pretty fairly valued, it's not some crazy PE company. There are a couple crazy that's crazy. It's it's stupid P. And it's down a lot, right? I mean, but but Apple, I mean, look, Apple doesn't grow. The only way they show growth is by buying back stock and reporting higher earnings per share. But their actual earnings, their actual net income is flat and their revenue growth is is negative. It's only smallly negative, but it's negative. Why would you pay a growth stock multiple for for negative Earning, I mean, negative revenue growth. I mean, you shouldn't. And and it's not it's not as dumb as the other ones, but it's it's twenty nine times, twenty nine times. There is a there is a day in my lifetime where twenty nine times was unthinkable, right? And that was that was on earnings, right? That that eleven twelve times earnings was normalized in a normal interest rate world. And then we had this pollution, right? We had this 13-year period of zero interest rates where if you take it to its logical, illogical conclusion, if interest rates are zero, if your discount rate is zero, your equity is worth infinity, right? One over zero is infinity. So that, but, and that's where we got this, this craziness. But look, that, Apple's a good company, to your point. They actually make good products, there are a whole bunch of companies. There's this company, Cloudera, right? I don't even really, I should know what they do, but I, I don't actually know what they do. They incinerate cash. They, they lose $200 million every year on a billion dollars of revenue. And yet it sells at 20 times revenue. Forget Forget selling it earnings because they don't have any earnings. And, and the one I love to pick on is C3AI, right? Which finally did crack, right? This thing is ticker symbols AI. And supposedly they help companies do AI. It's kind of like the company that helped companies turn to dot com, I guess. But, and this stock was down 75% since its IPO. The shorts were like, these guys have. 50 million revenue, they lose 50 million. They have 100 million revenue, they lose 100 million. They have 200 million revenue, they lose 200 million. That, it's just, I don't know what they're doing with it, but they're, they're giving it to somebody. But they, they're, they've, they've incinerated $600 million over the last four years. And when ChatGPT came out, because their ticker symbol is AI, oh, I'm buying open AI. Really? Really? You bought AI, the ticker, not knowing what company it was because you thought it was open AI? So the thing goes up 400% or 300%, four times. And now it's finally cracked. And look out below. I mean, the thing's worthless. That company is, the equity of that company is worthless. But I don't know. We're still, we're better in terms of valuing things because interest rates now are, you know, 5% and you got to use a 5% discount rate. But man, there's still a bunch of stupid stupid stuff out there. Yeah, I'm not disagreeing with that. And if, if if you look at more traditional markets, the NASDAQ and bonds are saying two very different things. So, you know, we'll see. What, one thing that I, the what, one thing I wanted to get your your take on is the, you, you know, Bill Dudley, the ex oh, yeah. Fed governor. Yep. Yeah. So he, there, this is a funny thing about Fed governors who suddenly become a lot more opinionated and honest after they leave the Fed. And that's, more look, that's, that's, more gentle, that's gentle teasing and poking. Obviously, when you're a part of the Fed, you, there's things you can and can't say. You have to toe the line. But Bill Dudley wrote this great op-ed. And he, a, a couple of years ago, I mean, he was really pushing Powell very publicly that you need to hike rates. And Powell, to his credit, 
has hiked rates very aggressively and has kept them up. So good job, Powell. Um, now what Bill Dudley is calling for is QT, uh, extensive QT over a multi-year period. That is the one that feels tough to me. I've shown this graph on this, on this, I'll, I'll get the, I'll get the chart up here of QT over time, but it's, this seems to be the thing that markets care about more even than, especially short term interest rates. Well, look, so, they have to, yeah. Michael, the Fed committed arguably the greatest policy error in the history of policy errors in 2020 right right there that 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 giant line um oh, for folks following along on audio what we're looking at is the federal reserve's balance sheet over a period of time starting in 2003 up till the present and what you can see are these these periods of you know around the the origination of QE back in 2008. Um, and then you sort of see it punctuated by these steep increases of a crisis. And then there's this like very consistent trend where they, where they try to lower it off, but oh, really we need to increase the balance sheet here. And it sort of plateaus. They do, uh, they do like there is, this is, this was the pal pivot back in 2018. You know, they, they started to try to let the balance sheet off and they get about 10% of the way there. And then, oh, there's another crisis. And it's the same thing. It's this very steep increase as QE infinity, and it doesn't matter. Then oh, we don't want to undo the gains that we've done. So it plateaus up. They get, this has actually been a pretty successful QT in the history since 2009. But then something inevitably breaks and they have to restart again. Sorry, just wanted to contextualize. That. No, 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 no. And I mean, you know, other than again, Total chart crime. It's a chart crime. Yeah, it's not. Because it's, it needs uh, to be log scale. Yeah. Um, because the percentage decrease isn't that isn't that big because we're talking from a, a high base. But but the, the point is is there. But the point I was making in, in the policy era is Stephanie Kelton convinced people that you can print as much money as you want out of thin air and there are no consequences if you have the world reserve currency. It's just a dumb theory. Um, although Guy Swan was great. I said, you know, she was the dumbest person that, that, that I can think of. And he said, no, no, we're the dummies. She's super smart. She convinced us all to do this. I'm like, oh, that's an interesting point. Um, and, and they're trying to reverse it. In fact, you know, the, the Fed governor who was there that we were debating um, put up the picture of you know, M2 has basically grown at seven and a half percent over the last 40 odd years. I mean, that that's a crazy number, right? Everybody talks about inflation's 2%. No, seven and a half percent money growth means, and that's why houses cost what they do and no one can afford to buy a house and, and why cars cost what they do. Crazy. A friend uh, of mine's daughter is getting ready to go to college. And he said, WNL, and WNL is a perfectly good little school. I mean, it is little. I mean, it's small. I shouldn't say little. I mean, it's a small school. Perfectly good. Perfect. I'll ask you, how much do you think their tuition is for a year? Tuition, room, and board. I don't even want to get... It's, um, 75000 That's an amazing guess. $83,000. Yeah. That's bananas. When I went to college... It's $11,000. Now look, I'm a hundred years old, but no, no. I mean, that wasn't, that was 38 years ago, but 11 to 83 is more than 3% inflation. Like orders of magnitude more. And this, but the point is that seven and a half percent went to 40, right? They printed the same amount of money in an 18 month period in the United States than the previous 247 years. It's kind of like my new favorite stat. Um, Eric Schmidt in 2010 said, since the beginning of time, which is a little bit hyperbolic because computers didn't exist at the beginning of time, but it said from the beginning of time until uh, to de till 2003, there were five exabytes of data created, mm. right? Five exabytes. So terabyte, petabyte, exabyte. Um, he said, today, 
and this was 2010, we produce that much every two days. Today, today, as you and I are talking today on Friday, okay, today, 329 exabytes of data will be created. That's why I'm wearing the Filecoin socks. I mean, think about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. but the point is, if your if your money supply grew by forty percent and you doubled the money supply, what do you have to do? You got to take it back. And so, money supply growth is negative for the first time in a hundred years, year over year. And they have this goal of QT. But here's here's what's going to happen. I'll tell you what's going to happen. So in two thousand seven. Japan, Bank of Japan said the same thing. Said, no more QQE. We're done. Because debt to GDP is too high and, and we got to stop this. We can't own all the bonds. Just take a look at the Bank of Japan's balance sheet sometime. And it's much higher today than it was then. Because they can't stop. And ultimately, there are no buyers of last resort except the buyers of last resort, unless they get really smart in Washington and they pass not a bill against stable coins, but a bill for stable coins. You want to secure, you know, the, the blessings of history, so to speak, for the dollar? Let stable coins suck up all of the treasuries. <laughs> Do you know that stable coins right now, I've got a chart for you. Stables. They're like the eighth largest in the world. 16th largest 16th. sovereign. And by the way, in, in terms of who they're in front of, some names you'd know, Norway, Saudi Pretty Arabia, man. the collective stable. So, the, and this is basically, we can just call it tether and circle, yeah. hold more US treasuries than Saudi Arabia. Pretty nuts statistic. And by the way, I do think that's what the regulatory bodies are worried about. They'd be worried about a quote, a run on, run on these stables where people try to redeem and then they have to sell you know, potentially tens of billions of dollars. But they change. don't. It's, I know. This is, this is the, this I, is the I, part, I know, I know. This is the part I, that's illogical, Michael. I, I agree. You don't, I, you don't redeem from a stable coin. You use it to exchange value instantaneously and it me, stays stable. Okay. That's let me the get, beauty. This is what I, I agree. So here, here's an analogy for folks that this, this is what's helped me over, over the years. And this is what I this is when I think Bitcoin and crypto does well, and I think it explains market cycles. Imagine a really large bucket with a bunch of water slopping around in it, and then a smaller bucket next to it. The large bucket with the water slopping around is TradFi, and the small bucket is crypto. So what happens is at various points, this bucket is kind of moving like this, the water sloshing around. At some point, there's a problem, and we put more water in the bucket. Some of that water slops over and falls into this smaller bucket and it absorbs that water. Now, that's what when that happens, right? That's an injection of liquidity. Some of that liquidity finds its way into the crypto ecosystem that finds its way to the best stuff first, which is why Bitcoin is leading right now. I'm going to show you this, this chart of ETH BTC. Um, but this is another this is another indication that we're of where we are in the cycle. Bitcoin dominance is up. ETH BTC is down. These are indicative of late stage bear market. <laughs> this is indicative of being in a late stage of a bear market. Um, and then the, the amount that Bitcoin and ETH can absorb as the majors is like, okay, we have lost our absorption power here. And then it trickles over into other things. And that is that is the helpful, that's the like five-year-old sort of metaphor that I have this like big, and eventually the smaller bucket is getting larger and larger and larger. The absorption power of the majors, Bitcoin and ETH, is getting larger and larger. So they're less volatile as well. But I think that's what's happening right now. Um, I know. I mean, look. I said, if if you want a chance to peacefully coexist rather than just be replaced, it's your only way out, right? Because the thing is, you blew it, right? <laughs> Fiat blew it, right? They... They, the people in charge of fiat, governments in charge of fiat, and this is not new, right? This is not just the United States. 775 paper currencies in the history of the world, three quarters of them no longer exist. They're gone. Zimbabwe, you know, the Zimbabwe dollar, gone. I mean, 
the boulevard in Venezuela. I mean, so this, this idea that, that you can spend endlessly with no repercussions, it's just wrong. And so what, what the only repercussion, the safety valve is, your currency devalues. And we, you know, in, in seniorage days, or gold coins, where we had literally gold coins, you know, the, the government would cut the edges, right? They'd literally cut your coins and make them smaller and take back a piece. So that's why I have the ridges on the quarter so you can see if it's been cut. Well, we don't have to do that anymore, right? They just push a button and boom, they, they steal your wealth. I think this is the one, this is the one thing that um, the Fed governor and I definitely disagreed on. And, and he was, he was very angry with me that I will claim, uh, contrary to what Ms. Yellen says, uh, there's no correlation between income and wealth inequality and inflation. I will argue it's what caused it. He's like, and he's like, well, that's correlation, not causation. Like, say whatever you want. You can believe whatever you want. You can convince yourself. But from 1776 to 1913, we didn't have a lot of increase in wealth inequality. Now we had a lot of other challenges with the country and some stuff. But, but bottom line is a dollar is worth a dollar. And then starting in 1913, the dollar started to erode through this inflation that's supposed to be good for us. And when income and wealth inequality rose. And it's not really, to me, it's really not hard to see. The people at the bottom don't own assets. So they don't benefit from the devaluation of the currency, right? Their house doesn't go up because they don't own a house. Their stocks don't go up because they don't own stocks. They are paid fiat. And if that fiat is worth less, then they lose. So what are they incented to do? Spend, not save. That's, I will argue, that was an intentional system, an intentional creation by some very, very wealthy families that took the idea from the Dutch in 1600 and the, and the English, the other half of the Rothschilds. And I mean, you can argue all you want that you think it's good for us, but it's good for rich people, not, not so much for the average person. Okay. So I disagree on the coordination mechanism, but I agree on the end result. So let me show you a let me show you a chart here. You know what? Actually, we should get let's see if I can find it. There's a great clip by George Carlin, which sums up, I think, the disagreement that oh, you George have on this show. George Carlin was a mad genius. Mad he genius. was. Here's here's the quote from him. What he says is you don't need a formal conspiracy when interests converge. And that is what I believe. What I believe is, like, I think this is the disagreement that you and I have on the show sometimes where I don't think these people are meeting and talking and there's some formal, like, 50 people that are making... I just think there's an intuitive understanding that the elites, the most powerful, wealthy people in all these countries kind of look alike. They have shared interests. They probably do interact at a lot of the same clubs, et cetera. I don't think there's a formal agreement, but it's kind of just like, yeah, I have a lot of money. I'd like my assets to grow. I want conditions where that where that can be the case. All right, Mike, I, yeah, all right your, your homework assignment for the weekend is to dive down the Bilderbergs. There's actually a meeting. Believe it or I not, will, there's actually a meeting of those people every year, which is you, crazy. You, what do you think? You might be right. You might, but I, where, where I'm agreeing with you is, is the outcome here. So oh, I know. look, so the, the, look at this. The, the real estate thing is very interesting. I know we talk about housing a lot, but I think it's, it's very, it's, it's critical. Like if you talk to, what we're looking at here, by the way, is a, the real estate assets in the US broken out by generation. And you can see the millennials here are just getting absolutely smoked. I mean, we're so far behind where people have been in the past. Yeah. And I think there is a, there's a concept in humanity. It's like, where you, you want to set goals that feel like a stretch, but achievable. Anyone who's set goals within the context of a business that's the exercise that you're trying to do. If you're trying to set a sales quota or a goal for a company, stretch goals, but achievable. And the reason that you want to do that is if people have a goal, something to work for that they can, they can do very well, they want to exceed that goal. If you set a goal that everyone believes is impossible, you won't get people working hard. You'll get disenfranchisement across the board. And I think that's broadly the story of 
millennials and Gen Zs, where you look at these, if you, if you just talk to, and when I say millennials, like just talk to a 30, 35 year old, talk to a 20 year old, it, and it gets worse the younger you get. The idea of owning a home or securing financial freedom through a more traditional route of hard work, save up, buy the home, get the promotion. I mean, it's so negligible. And so what you're seeing, I think, is a younger generation that older people are like, why are these people so lazy? The reason that they're lazy and disenfranchised is because they're disenfranchised, is because they are correctly looking at the price of homes and things like that and being like, I can't do this through conventional means. And what it leads to, I think, is the casino of casinoification of the stock market where, and this is also, frankly, it's a tailwind for crypto in a really depressing dystopian kind of way, because the thinking is, I'm not going to get to own a home and do all the things that my parents did by just investing in the S&P 500. What I need to do is I need to take big bets and hope that one of those things plays off. So you get people YOLOing into GameStop, AMC, meme coins, et cetera. And I think that is the connection. Uh, I I, I think it's a, it's a, it's a really good analysis and bring up a really n- number of interesting points. I'm going to go not sinister Saturday, but sunny Saturday, opposite view. Oh, great. Okay. I have an opposite view to my own view, by the way. No, no, no. Here, but here's, here's, here's why. So what has happened um, is we are returning through technology, I believe, to our genetic roots, right? We were nomadic people. We didn't stay in one place. People moved around and, and they went where the harvest was good or where the weather was good or where, where there were other people to collaborate with. And uh, technology has enabled that, right? You don't have to pick up and move to San Francisco to work for a company. If you have talent, they'll let you work from North Carolina or New Jersey or wherever. And so because of this enabling factor of technology, this idea that home ownership should be your, your primary asset has faded. So what, what I think we should really show is, is the combination of home ownership and equity and or crypto ownership. Because my belief is that the average millennial actually has a much bigger investing account than I ever did when I was young because I bought a home when I was 33 and I didn't have any money left to do anything else. And so those are the assets of accumulation. And particularly if you have something like Bitcoin, which is deflationary, which is, you know, it resists the devaluation of the currency. Larry Fink even told you to buy some because of that. Um, I, I think it's an interesting dynamic. And so the positive for me is after World War II, you came back and they had the things like the GI Bill, go get a degree. And, and there was this, you know, they changed the mortgage interest deduction and they, they told all of us boomers, buy homes and, and create wealth that way. And then over time, they said, no, in 1986, Tax Act of 86, or, no, you, you need to own stocks. So you're going to have these 401ks. And, and so they created that type of savings for the type of life that we had, right? You moved to, like, so everyone came back to uh, uh, California right after the war. And like, I ain't going back to Minnesota. I ain't going back to New York. I'm going to live here. So California became this incredibly populous place because it's a pretty nice lifestyle. And so I, I just think we're in a, in a different time. And therefore, there's a different mix of assets. What I think is really cool and this is where I get really excited, really super sunny Saturday, is what we're doing with this increase in technology, right? Blockchain technology, the internet of blockchains, the the truth net. We're liberating $7 trillion of rent to the banks, the brokers, the insurance companies, the auditors, the accountants, all the stuff that was built up around the trust industry that enabled this lifestyle of, of, of non-migrationary, sedentary, not sedentary, like sitting, but, but you bought a house, you stayed there, you worked for one company and, and you got your gold watch and you, you sat on the front porch in retirement. Nope. 
That's not the future. Now, talent wins. Global talent wins. And there's a collaboration because of technology. And then if we unleash that $7 trillion and we fix money with Bitcoin and we have a place where our assets don't get destroyed by central bank largesse, whole, oh, kitty wants on. Um, holy moly. I think the power of unleashing that human potential, mm. unbelievable. You know what, Mark? That's a really great insight. The yeah, it you could look at housing and essentially what we're doing, we've we've made acceptable as society is to put 80 to 90 percent of your net worth into a super leveraged illiquid asset. That's yeah. what it is. It's yeah. owning a home. That's what it is. And there there was a and not mark a, the market. Don't mark the market so you don't worry about all it. All right. There, there is there was an atten- intentional shift. Morgan Housel right, wrote a great post on this. The transition of the US economy post World War II into a more consumption based economy. And these, yep. these, yeah, the, the government wants to provide uh ways for its citizens to increase their quality of life through increased assets and purchasing power. Yep. It, it is, and and now I guess maybe we're figuring that out, and that's what digital assets represent. And Speaking Amen. of digital assets, by the way, because I got to give it one plug, there's a, there's a, Mark, I didn't tell you about this before. There's a contest between the other podcasts of Blockworks and on the margin to bring the most people to Das London. So, Das London, come on, hang out with us. Hang out with this us. This is what we're going to be talking about, folks. This, this, th- there shouldn't be any competition. I mean, we I are by far the best podcast of the family. No, and the family's good. We, we love all our family members equally, except yeah. we're the best. Yeah. So, Clearly yeah. come hang with us, come to London. Like I mean, we love the weird uncle at Thanksgiving, but hang with the patriarch, right? At yeah, the head of the yeah, exactly. yeah, that's that's what I'd yeah, say. Yeah. yeah. The cool I mean, cousins. and again, cool who wants to go hang out with those super handsome guys? You want to hang out with you know the old guy. I mean, that's come on, that's that's way more fun. You look better by you stand next to me, you look awesome. Hey, people have been calling you a silver fox in the comments for, for years now, Mark. So so Margin 20, and we're, we're not just saying this to get you over there. Margin 20, it's basically a vacation to London, right? Fish and chips, pub culture, baby. Come on, sunny London town. It's going to be it's, great. It's going to be, no, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing because it's going to be right, either right after or right before the ETF approval. It's going to be right before the halving. It is going to be, look, we are, we are on the cusp of, I believe the most interesting acceleration of the S curve of adoption of, of the truth net, right? 2024 is the beginning. See, this is the, it's the beginning of the 14 year cycle. We've been talking about the 14 year cycle for five years, but the beginning is 2024, 54, 68, 82, 96, 2010, 2024. This is the beginning of the fun. So you know what? Party with us. a li- little bit of, I don't know if this is alpha, but insight that wouldn't otherwise be necessarily publicly available. We produce lots of different types of content. We have content we internally refer to as, as our suits content and our t-shirts content. And for years, the t-shirts content has been trouncing the suits content. There's much more interest in things like NFTs and metaverse and DeFi and nitty gritty of crypto. But that is, changed recently and there is a renewed interest in institutional stuff and that stuff is starting to improve and look i we talked about a little bit at the show larry fink coming out and blessing crypto that has never happened before and last cycle we got paul tudor jones calling bitcoin the fastest horse but there's a huge difference between a guy like paul tudor jones who is like a very revered and respected guy within the investor community but he's He's a hedge fund, he's right? A hedge fund the, he's a maverick. The, the he's a maverick. Massive difference in between someone like that versus Larry Fink, who can who controls the largest asset management company in the world. So this could be the institutional cycle, and that's I think that's the narrative that you've got to get a hold of. This it time. is. Well, it is. It is, and we're we're seeing it in as as we fundraise. You know, we just did our first close with two big institutions, and mm. and more to come. And, and look, this. This is inevitable, right? Technological evolution is inevitable. And 
You know, what's, what's really amazing is it goes beyond just crypto, right? It goes beyond just blockchain. And, and we've been talking about this is my new, my new thing, the ABCDs of the digital age, AI, blockchain, chips, and data. And I talked about it. Today, 329 exabytes of data will be created. And we need capabilities, technologies to capture that data, organize that data, analyze that data, and act on that data. And that is what the future holds. That's what AI does. It's what chips do. And and it's what blockchains allow us to have. And here's the thing that I want to get really excited. Bitcoin will become the V, the capital T, capital H, capital E, global settlement layer. We won't have centralized systems. We will have decentralized systems. And all assets will eventually settle to Bitcoin. Now, there'll be other things on top of it, L2s and L3s and whatever. But that's amazing. That's amazing because it, Excited about the future. I know we talked. Uh, about so, it. No, it's so cool. I'm, I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be even weirder and cooler than we could expect. I, I will die on that hill of being on well, that Well, and here's, here's, here's the craziest part, right? Over the next 50 years, technology will increase, technological advancement will increase a quadrillion times. That's just the math of, of where we are and where we're going. And... And maybe not all the Jetsons, like maybe we won't have flying cars and maybe we won't all have Rosie the Robot and take pills to eat. Um, But Jetsons have been right on a lot and they're going to be right on a lot in the future. So, yeah. All right, Mark, we got to wrap it here, but best hour of my week. Um, Yeah, this is fun. This is good. Yeah. Cheers. Have a good one.